Hello everyone, welcome to my car time. My car time will be the effects of technology on social interactions. And first, we're going to look at my attention getter. I apologize that it's in Japanese, but there will be subtitles to watch. I hope you guys enjoy it. <laughs> ボヤボヤ病なんだよ。ぼんやりしか見えなくて。でもこのマスクかぶってるとなんでかちょびっとだけ見えすんだよ。ああ、ピンホール効果ってやつな。よく聞けすいか。てめえはな、ドキンガン
This was by a research professor. So it's just important to realize that any technology will be interacting and affecting your life no matter what, whatever you do, because right now you're watching this on a screen or whatever you're watching it on, which is technology. So it must be affecting you somehow. And two, the other effect is technological growth. So let's look into that right now and see how much technology has actually increased in the last 20, 30 years and how much it will actually affect your own life. All right, so on to technological growth. So the first example of technological growth in our society is Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the prediction that for every two years, there will be more transistors added to a chip, making it twice as fast. So it will be an exponential growth. And as we look to the graph right here, it shows that from the 1970s, when the prediction was made, to um, 2020, that this prediction is actually true, that technology, technology on microchips are increasing exponentially. Um, the second example would be the human genome or the sequencing of the human genome. This was a huge um, breakthrough for um, biology and genetics. Um, this is showing just another example of technology. And this was done by shotgun sequencing. Shotgun sequencing is a technique for determining the sequence of an entire chromosome and the entire genetics of, of an entire uh, being, um, being, person, whatever you want to call it. And it's done by taking random fragments of DNA and shooting it through something like our beams or whatever, and you get a bunch of little fragments. Then it's put into, those fragments are then coded and put into a computer and laid all to each other. And then the fragments are reassembled back to each other, laying on top of each other. This was the technology that they actually use to allow for shotgun sequencing, for allowing the sequencing of the human genome. So these two um, technologies or predictions of technology have shown that just technology is increasing rapidly for, um, within our society and that it's important to understand that we need to deal with this issue and how it affects social interactions. So the main question I will be posing today, yesterday, tomorrow, whenever you're watching this, is is technology overall, overall beneficial for social interaction? So there's the pro side, which says, yes, we are on net benefit getting more out of technology than it's harming us. And the con side, we know it's actually harming us more than it's benefiting us. So let's look under the pro side first. So the pro side would be saying that technology is over net benefiting us in social interactions. And the two main areas that I'm gonna look into this is one, opportunities for disabled people, and two, the way that AI and the health profession are interacting. So first let's look into the opportunity for disabled people that technology brings to them. So first let's look into the definition of disabled. So disabled is of a person having physical or mental condition that limits movement, senses, or activity. So this could be really extreme um, for like complete disability, or it could be very um, not extreme. And the first example I bring is glasses. As we saw in the attention getter, this girl was un unable to see because she was nearsighted. And due to the fact that Senku, the guy with the cool green hair, was able to create a lens and put it in her hat, she was actually able to see. And this improved her ability to see people, as she said before, that she wanted to be able to see their faces. So let's look at some statistics for glasses. 143 million people adults wear prescription eyewear in the United States. Over 70% of the workforce requires people to wear glasses. Computers are the number one source of vision complaints in the workforce, meaning that they are actually more people needing glasses due to the fact that they are using technology. And one every four kids have vision problems. All these statistics show that just technology of glasses is able to actually increase people's vision or be able to see. And because they're Ability to see is being increased. Obviously, they're able to interact with other people better because, well, they're able to see. So that's the first point, which is glass. Uh, let's go into another area. So the next area would be hearing aids, actually. Um, hearing aids are able to increase the, um, or allow for people to hear better um, that have reduced hearing th through technology. Um, let's look into some statistics. So 15% of school-aged kids from 6 to 19 have some degree of hearing loss. 3.65 million hearing aids are distributed in the United States in 2016. And according to John Hopkins Co-Linear Center for Hearing and Public Health, approximately 38.2 million Americans, which is 14.3% of them, report some um, case of hearing loss. 
So this shows that there's a lot of people in the United States that have hearing loss or around the world. These are just statistics from the United States, but it just shows that there's a lot of people with hearing loss or hearing disability. So the technology of hearing aids are able to increase or allow people to actually hear more. And obviously hearing is important to social interactions because as I speak to you, which is the main way people socially interact, if you're not able to hear me, you're not able to social interact. So technology is able to increase social interaction through that way. So the last area we're going to be looking into is prosthetics for disabled people. So around 2.1 million people in the United States have at least one loss of limb. And roughly around 185,000 amputations occur every year in the United States. The reasons um, people live without a limb are either to vascular diseases, which is accounts for 54%, trauma, which accounts for 45%, and cancer, which accounts for less for 2%. So the reason prosthetics are um, able to increase social interaction is because they play a large role in rehabilitation and also allowing for people to have more independence. Um, because as you have a prosthetic, you're not have to rely on other people to um, help you with this stuff. So prosthetics are really crucial for social interaction because they increase the abilities for people to actually meet other people and socially interact. So that's why they're really important. So let's get on to the AI and the health profession. So first we're going to look at the AI diagnosing cancer. So Google has an AI that uses deep learning and they apply it to um, breast cancer um, breast cancer detection. So they looked over 29,000 different mammogram images of women that either had breast cancer or, or were um, went to go get a mammogram study pretty much. And AI, AI was trained to either did um, confirm or deny if cancer was there. And later it was confirmed or denied by um, either a biopsy, which is like a small surgery or um, an x-ray study. And it competed against six other independent physicians in like accuracy, right? And the AI actually was able to cut um, false positives by 5.7% um, compared to their doctor counterparts. And also the AI had a 9.4 increase in potential miss breast cancer cases. So it was actually able to determine um, if um, better, if they are the, it was actually able to, to better determine if there was cancer in the breast compared to the physicians. So it just shows that AI technology was able to increase um, the ability to catch breast cancer. Other AI I wanna look into is bacterial identification. So bacterial identification is really important because well, you can look at the pandemic right now, although it's a virus, which is different than a bacteria. It also, um, they both can have similar effects where they cause people to get sick. So if an AI is able to determine faster that humans are better than humans, if we're able to be get sick from bacteria, then it's going to be really good for us as a society. So this um, AI actually used 25,000 different images of bacteria and eventually cropped them down to 100,000 different cases of bacteria, just different versions of bacteria. Three different uh, um, bacteria were tested in this specific AI. And after training it over and over and over again, because that's what the requirements for AI are, is just repetition until we're able to fine tune our ability to test stuff. Um, it resulted in 95% accuracy between three different categories of bacteria. Why do we care about this AI? Where, why do we care about um, like helping the disabled people? Well, how does it relate to this topic, right? So the conclusion is technology is able to give people with impediments or people that are disabled, the ability to interact as if they were not disabled. So if you have glasses, you're able to see like a person that doesn't have glasses. If you have hearing aids, you're able to hear like a person that doesn't have hearing aids. And if you have a prosthetic, you're able to walk like a person that doesn't have a prosthetic. So all these are important to social interaction because they're all senses and senses are crucial obviously to social interaction. Say if I wasn't able to hear you, it'd be harder for me to socially interact with you. The other important thing is that technology is able to help with people's health. And obviously health is really crucial to social interactions because if you're dead, you're not socially interacting. So having a good health is obviously contingent on social interactions. Did it work? No. Did it work? No. Working. Wait, SpongeBob! We're not cavemen! We have technology! It didn't work. 
So onto the con side. So well, well, first, if you were wondering, yes, in between cuts, I did get a haircut. And yes, it's the next day. And yes, I got it from Josh. So shout out to Basement Cuts. <laughs> All right, so onto the con side. So um, there's two parts to the con side. The first part of the content I'm going to be talking about is cell phone addictions, um, how they affect people and how social interactions occur after that. And the second part I'm going to be talking about is the Japanese, <laughs> the Japanese. And the second part I will be talking about is a crisis going on in Japan that their actual population is decreasing rather than increasing, which is the normal. So let's look into it. So first, let me define another term. Let's look at the term addiction, right? Just to get a, a base status, right? So an addiction is a biopsychosocial disorder characterized by a compulsive engagement with rewarding behaviors despite adverse consequences. In regards then to a phone addiction, the Swanee University of Technology in South Africa actually states the biggest non-addictive drug of the 21st century. And so about how many people like use phones like in general? So we could look to a case study in Spain, actually. In Spain, the ad there's more cell phones in Spain than there are people on average. Um, 81 of those cell phones are actually smart phones. The ones with the screens that have access to the internet and stuff like that. For regards to children, 30% of 10 year olds have a cell phone in Spain as of 2015. 70% of 12 year olds and 84% of 14 year olds. And in regards to really young children, starting from age of two, um, young like kids have the access to smartphones due to the fact that their parents have it and allowing them to use the phones. So another word that we're, I'm going to want to define is nomophobia. And nomophobia is defined as the fear of not having a cell phone or being without your cell phone at a certain point in time. There's four, oh, I, I spell addiction wrong every, ignore my spelling. Don't worry about it. I, <laughs> there's four different effects um, that come with cell phone addictions. First is behavioral effects. With behavioral effects, people prefer being um, the phone actually when they have a phone addiction over personal contact, personal connection. Two, they have a lot of sleep insomnia and disturbances. Three, they use it excessively to satisfy them or to counter dysphoric moods that they have. And then they also, um, cell phone addictions cause anxiety and loneliness, which are un when they're unable to receive or send out messages like immediately. Next is age. So within age, the most affected area of people that with cell phone addictions are adolescents. And the average age is approximately 14 years old. And the earlier you receive a cell phone, the higher probability that you're gonna get a phone addiction. In regards to gender, females have a higher dependency and problematic use of cell phones compared to males. Females tend to use their cell phones for social interaction via text or other social medias. And females spend more time on phones, whereas men have the same problem or similar tendencies in regards to specifically the internet. All right, next on to self-esteem, there was a case study of 40 students from Mumbai City and it showed a high significance between people being lonely and cell phone addiction. And the cause of this loneliness from cell phone addiction is that, well, people are just using their phones instead of actually meeting people in real life. The conclusion from the cell phone addiction is twofold. One, it's directly effect affecting the age group of us, the pe people in this, watching this video, I was gonna say in this classroom, but watching this video, because we are adolescent or we are very young and cell phone addictions can affect us very highly. And two, just being aware that this is occurring within our society and not just like, oh, you're addicted to your phone, like Mr. Barr tells Ethan, but like actually it's a problem that could happen. So just being aware of those two different things. Yeah, Ethan, I called you out. <laughs> Next, um, let's go into the Japanese population crisis. So what is the Japanese population crisis? Um, what is, what isn't? So let's look at a case study from Ubari, Japan. In Ubari, Japan, um, there used to be 21 elementary schools. And as of right now, there's only one elementary school. There used to be 100,000 people there now. People there, and now there's only 10,000. In their hospital, they don't even have a maternity ward anymore because there are zero births in this town per year 
because no one is giving birth there and no one is living there that is young. So there's there seems to be a problem. This problem is occurring around Japan. Ubari is an extreme example, but... So let's look at some statistics. 70% of men and 60% of women in Japan are not only single, but they're not in any relationship with the other sex at all. Um, in 2019, there was eight, um, 870,000 births, but 1,376,000 deaths. This is showing that there's more deaths than births, which means that the population is decreasing. We can look at the statistics, and it shows that around 2006, the birth rate actually went below the death rate, which is pretty much showing that um, the population is decreasing. So the reason this is crisis is occurring is twofold. One, the work culture is really tough in Japan for with long hours and low pay, which is like just causes a lot of stress for a lot of people. And two, men are more drawn in this Japanese culture to virtual or manga rather than real relationships because it's easier for them. All right, so on to more definitions. <laughs> um, a manga is a style of Japanese comic book or graphic novel typically aimed for adults as well as children. So mangas are just for kids like a comic book is in the United States, but mangas are for all age groups. The next is otaku. As a young person obsessed with the computers or particular aspects of popular culture to the determinant of their social skills. And the last definition is hikiomori, which is a person who's completely withdraws from social um, from society and cuts off ties and even avoids working, preferring to lock themselves in to escape instead. So those are our three definitions. So to explain virtual dating, I'm going to first show another clip that is going to explain just what is happening. So it's because it's a little confusing. I had it first. Play clip now. A 21-year-old Sako Aruno of Osako works in a supermarket and sings in a J-pop band. His girlfriend's name is Manaka. She's 16. They're a Love Plus couple. Here, Saku slips into the role of a schoolboy and meets the virtual Manaka while playing the game. I pretended I was the new kid at school and decided to check out the tennis team. When I first saw Manaka, she was tending the grounds and we had a chat. That's how our relationship started. Since then, we've become closer and closer. <laughs> Trust is the most important thing in a relationship, and Manaka is a partner I can trust. She'd never cheat on me. That's why I prefer her to a real girlfriend. So after seeing that video, you have a better understanding of what virtual dating is. Virtual dating is pretty much with not a real person and actually a fictional character. As we saw in it, the guy in the thing preferred having that relationship over a real one because it's less obligation, it's a lot easier. I can look at the quotation from another um, documentary I watched that they said, as long as I have time, I'll continue this relationship forever. And, but it's the kind of relationship I, I wish we had in high school. So it's preferred over a real relationship because there's no strings attached and it's easier to deal with because it's not a real social interaction, it's fake and created by a computer. Um, these types of relationships occur at all ages. The ages of the two men I was talking about in the other documentary were 39 and 38, but within the game that they were playing, they were age 17 and 15 playing in a high school career. And you may ask, why is there also just such an appeal for this specific type of online dating, right? There could be other versions of online dating where I see a real person on online, right? But this goes into the kawaii appeal. Kawaii is meaning cute in Japan or Japanese. Quote, quotes, Kawaii aesthetic can be a vehicle for socialization that shapes the identity and viewpoints of many Japanese due to its unchecked, pervasive nature. So this kawaii appeal is just saying that, well, dudes are into these cute, innocent looking females, and it's just a problem that's happening within the Japanese society. They're preferring this over real relationships because they are desiring what happened back in their high school, but, but wanted to go back. They're wanting an easier, less strings attached relationship that they can control. The summarization of this whole interaction is in quotes. First, the Kawai is a pervasive aesthetic that permeates Japanese culture. And the Japanese experience of extreme stress 
an instability in the career, or otherwise uncomfortable situation may default to the comforting sphere of kawaii productions such as anime or manga. Second, becoming an obsessive consumer of such products as an otaku as a part of a subculture promotes en endless indulgence in fantasy world of mo characters instead of depriving, deriving happiness and comfort based in reality, a substitutive effect. So quickly to define Mo, which was stated in there, Mo is the quality of a fictional female character and being youthful and innocent and vulnerable in an idealized way. So basically all this guy was trying to say pretty much was that this Kawhi aesthetic brings people in because they're attracted to this Mo type of character. And then due to the fact that they are realizing that they can escape from their stressful work or their obligations or whatever is happening, they start to prefer this relationship or this fake whatever over a real relationship, which is causing a real relationship to occur. As stated previously, the statistics the statistics are that 70% of men and 60% of female have no relationship at all. And this is because men are preferring this relationship over a, re a real female. So in conclusion, there's pretty much a six, six main points I want to talk about from conclusion. So Japanese, the Japanese are rooted in a deep tradition with high, value of, high values of marriage that comes with a lot of responsibility, right? So that's our first point, right? The second point is that the Japanese workforce has a high amount of work hours with a subpar pay, leading to stress about obligations. Next is that the Japanese and manga culture is a huge industry that attack, attracts a ton of different ages, right? Um, and then four, men are, are drawn into these um, fictitious female or mo characters to relieve their stress from their work lives. And then five, men become deeply involved in the subculture and prefer it over a real social interaction with real women. And because there are less social interactions with women, there are less babies being made, which means the birth rate falls because less relationships are occurring. So next is my opinion. What do I, what side do I pick? I believe this topic is not a black or white subject. I can't be like, yes, I want only the good stuff of technology, right? Because, well, as I showed, there's also bad stuff. So I believe there's also many different areas that I did not talk about, but I do believe that technology right now in our current age is more beneficial for social interactions than it harms us. So I give two points for this. One, any technology that helps the ability for more social action has a high impact on society, right? So that'd be glasses that increases social interaction because well, you're able to see, which means you're able to interact better socially. You're able to hear, you talk about hearing aids, you talk about prosthetics, you talk about driving, like <laughs> anything that like increases social interaction from technology is a good thing, right? And then two, technology also has approved every, like a ton of different areas of work. So any different work environments that like have any technology or many like different in society that is harmful. But, 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 I also believe that there's negative, Im the negative impacts of technology are growing at an alarming rate. So first, when technology begins to cause addictions and cultural overhauls, it creates huge issues for people interacting with each other because well, the whole dynamics has changed, right? We can look at cell phones, right? 20 years ago, my mom wasn't texting my dad. The social interactions are changing, right? Which can be a good thing, but in this circumstance is a bad thing because it's causing addiction, it's causing, well, less sex to happen in Japan, which less kids are happening. And then two, for instance of primitive technology, the creation of the, like, let's say the wheel had no effect on social interaction because it did not cause addictions or the alteration of culture in a negative way. So I believe that technology from the start always had benefits and not many negatives, right? But as soon as technology started becoming less of a, let's help um, humankind progress the society and it's more like a niche offshoot, it can create problems because it's just not being used for a positive thing. So let's look into two verses that I wanted to pull out for specifically for this topic. So we can look at 1 Peter 5, 8, ESV version. You can turn to that in your bio if you want. Yeah, I'll just read it. So be so reminded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour, seeking someone to devour. So this one is specifically related to my topic because as a cell phone addiction and as of Japanese culture, Although technology can be a good thing, like you playing Fortnite with your buddies, great, go do it.
but realize that there's also a lot of different problems that can come with technology and you have to be aware of it. Be sober minded, be watchful. The other verse is Proverbs 6, 27 through 28. And it says, can man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes and not be burned? Or can someone walk in hot coals and his feet not be scorched? In the same way, in regards to addictions and regards to um, the Japanese culture, just you have to be sober minded, be watchful of these things. Be of critical mind because it's important to know that these things are happening with the society and to avoid them because they have many different bad implications that for your own lives and for other people's lives as well. Technology is a tool and as humans we determine if it is a good thing or a bad thing. That's my opinion on this whole topic. So why should y'all agree with my opinion, right? So you should agree with me for three reasons. One, one is a smart man learns from his mistakes. But a wise man learns the mistake of others. We realize that cell phone addictions are a problem and we realize that there is a problem within the Japanese culture. And we don't want to do that ourselves, so obviously. So learning from their mistakes is and avoiding it is the best option for us. Two, being aware of situations like cell phone addictions and the Japanese social culture, we are able, better able to make decisions for our own lives compared to well, their lives. And the third reasoning is from Pew Research um, facilities state that roughly a third of respondents predict that the harms to well-being will outweigh the positives overall in the next decade. So it's just saying that everyone is in realization that the negative effects of technology are coming and they're coming soon. Next, it's important to, for us specifically act, act on self addictions within our own lives because we are a prime demographic for the situation. Keeping yourself in check with um, addictions is always important because they prohibit you from doing other important things within your life. Like any addiction causes like any problems. So when cell phone addiction causes you to have behavioral issues, it causes you to have um, sleep insomnia, it causes you to have lower self-esteem, it causes you to have more reliance upon your cell phone. So after you hear this presentation and other, others like it, like other the ones that talk about addictions like pornography and stuff like that, and not acting upon it is ignorant because you're actively deciding to continue harm that you're doing yourself if you are in a cell phone addiction. So it's just important that you take precautionary steps in preventing any addictions or, although I can't speak for a full-fledged plan for like solving the decline of Japanese um, um, culture, there is some like actions for phone addictions that you can simply do to solve your problems, right? So one, you can get, get rid of your phone or demote something that's less appealing. You can set limitations on yourself. You can talk to individual people about it. So having accountability is also really important for that kind of stuff. And having a critical mindset is also really crucial for specifically technology because technology is growing and changing at an exponential rate. So just being aware of what is happening within technology is also really important. Knowing how it affects your lives and how you can how it affects other lives so you, can, so you can take care of yourself and others is also really important. And the final point I would like to leave you guys with is the most important thing I believe that needs to take place in the digital, digital world that is that it can never substitute for the real world. People tend to use technology to escape their problems instead of solving them, actually. So instead of using your phone as a crutch or using technology as a crutch, use it as an extension of yourself. Use it as a tool, not something that can harm you. So that's my final thoughts on this presentation. Thank you all so much for watching. I know it was a bit all over the place, but the point is that I believe that this is really important. It's close to my heart and thanks y'all for joining. Um, hope you enjoy other car times. Um, again, shout out to Basement Cuts. Go get a cut for them. They do great. And Josh plays fire music, so thanks for watching.